Good morning, good morning. You all are the glory of God. I thank God for you. I honor the Father for you. I bless the Lord for you. And I'm so grateful to be here in your presence once again. It's really an honor to serve you. And I love you all to the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. I also want to take time out to just appreciate those who have been given to the ministry. I, I just want to say thank you so very much. I am so, so, so grateful. And I just pray that the Lord who has begun a good thing in your life will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I speak abundance over you and I bless every dimension of your finances. And the Bible that says, you know, is blessed to give than to receive. <laughs> I just honor the Father for your givings at the same time, that what you have given, the Father will multiply it back onto you in greater measures. I'm not going to put sevenfold or hundredfold, no, but in greater measures, in greater measures, blessing every dimension of your business, of your family, of all that you have laid your hands to do. May the Lord continue to uphold you in Jesus' mighty name. I appreciate you for all that you continue to do and your support. God bless you. Amen and amen. I just want to share this word because I believe this is a word that the Father has laid in my spirit. Uh, because I remember there was a time I was watching something and this, uh, this scripture really uh, manifested in, greater, in a greater dimension. And when I, the first time I saw it, I'm like, wow. You know, I, I saw that in itself and I'm like, wow, really? You know, this, this can only be God because definitely, you know, God, whatever God does, he does it what? Intentionally. He never makes mistakes. No, not at all. God never makes mistakes. No, he doesn't. So I want to begin with this scripture according to Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And this is, this is a scripture that we're basically all familiar with. Yes, we're all familiar with it. But most of the time, you know, when we read it, it has, it's in dimensions. Yes, it's, it's in dimensions. So most of the time when this is speaking to you, you have to understand what the father is saying concerning him. You know, when he says, and we know that in all things. So what are the things? In all things. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. <laughs> Do you see it? Because when I was, when I, I remember when I was still in the world, I used to say, well, all things, you know, uh, all, you know, it will make sense eventually. All, it all happens for a reason. That's, that's what I used to say back then. And the Lord had to correct. He said, well, you were not in, you were not in Christ when you used to speak that word. So what you did then, no, it's, you know, you, <laughs> because you did some things that was not of me. So it didn't happen for a reason. <laughs> Do you see it? That didn't happen for a reason. But the Bible says that in all things, God works for good of those who love him who have been what called according to his purpose so if you're walking in the purpose of god for what he has called you to do then everything happening in that situation or in that purpose god is working it out for your good do you see it as long as you are in the will of god everything that you do everything that happens right in there things are working together for your good can you see it? <laughs> because when Saul was misbehaving, not everything was working for his good. But when David was, because he was in the will of God, everything was working for his good. With Christ Jesus, when he was doing all that he was doing and they were coming against him, all things were working together for him, even until when he went on the cross and when he was, when he resurrected. Do you see it? Because in Acts chapter 2, they repented and they were reconciled. So, we can begin to understand that scripture that yes, as long as you're in the will of the father, all things work together for you. So we have to all the time see the word. So I want us to understand that we have to see a word for what it is. You know, a lot of times, most people, they read the scripture and when they read the scripture, they're always looking for revelation. Oh, I'm, 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 I, you know, I want to get a revelation. I want to, you know, they read and read and get a revelation. They want to always get a revelation out of a scripture. I'm not saying it's not good for to have a revelation because Ephesians 1, 17, 18 tells us that what, you know, wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, it will, wisdom and re revelation will be with you, to, you know, to bring the knowledge of the father unto you. We understand that. But there comes a time, you know, the book of John chapter one declares in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word is God. So that means 
whatever word the father is speaking at that particular moment in time, just take it as it is because it is the word. He just wants you to believe in the word. Do you see it? He just wants you to believe the word. So if the word says for, you know, if the word basically goes on to say, uh, I, 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 I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, then take it as the present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory. Just believe that the glory of the Lord will manifest in your present suffering. So this is most of the time why I've always encouraged each and every one of us. Rejoice in your suffering. Do you know why? Because God allows people to come against you because he wants to set you up for, for promotion. So most of the time when people are coming against you, you don't, people, they don't realize that they are being set up for your promotion. So when you're going through the suffering of everything that is happening, it's for your promotion. That's what they did with Jesus. When Judas came against them, he thought, hey, we've all, you know, the devil thought, hey, yes, I've had Jesus. I've had him exactly where he is. Everybody ran away from Jesus. They left him alone. But look at eventually what happened in resurrection. Yes, that's exactly my point. So that's why the father always says, take the word exactly as it is. So it is a place that we have to see the word for what it truly is. And not just seek revelation, because the more you focus on the word, revelation will come right after. And sometimes when you read the word, you might actually be walking that revelation when you <laughs> put that Bible down. Do you see it? So look at it, for example. The Bible tells us in John chapter 4 that Jesus was with the woman by the well. Maybe you've just read that scripture this morning. And eventually what happens? Immediately you put down the Bible, you've said your prayer. Then somebody comes along and then you begin to minister to that person. Do you see it? That is the manifestation of revelation. So revelation is in dimensions, not in just, I want to basically understand it. It's not, we read the Bible, first of all, not to just to try to understand it, just read it for what it is. And eventually as you continue in reading, understanding comes, revelation comes because consistency is most times what God is looking for in Jesus mighty name. Amen. And amen. So the Lord, like I've always said, speaks when we take his word as spoken. So, this, so when we begin to understand that word in itself, this is why I've always encouraged that the Bible is written in three dimensions. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit says. The patriarch, what they were saying. And then eventually the translator, what he's saying. So by focusing on what God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is saying, you can understand which of the prayers the patriarchs prayed were actually in alignment with the will of God. And the ones that they were not in alignment, you stay away from that. Because even the Bible tells us, you know, that's why you see a lot of people, sometimes they are praying prayers, but it's not in the will of the Father. How do you know it's not the will of the Father? Because it could be what God has not spoken concerning that person. Yes, God hasn't spoken anything concerning what it is that you're praying about for that person, but you're just praying because this is what you believe. <laughs> do you understand it? So it's a place that we have to be careful. Otherwise, we can basically walk into something that we're not supposed to walk into. So by going back to the very beginning, the Lord says, the Lord says, then we're able to determine and justify the word that this is what the father is saying. I stay in accordance to that place because he says, whatever I ask of him, he will give when I ask with the right motive. Do you see it? In the book of Jude, <laughs> sorry, in the book of James, because a lot of people were not asking with the right motives in Jesus mighty name. Amen and amen. So from this scripture in itself, I want us to look at the dimension of Isaiah chapter 45. And from Isaiah chapter 45, we see this is the declaration that was made concerning Cyrus. You know, it's amazing, right? So I'm going to start from verse 4, and I'm going to stop at verse 8. So we read together in concert. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have called thee by name. I have some surnamed thee, that thou hast no, but thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no one else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down ye heavens from above 
and let skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Do you see it? I want us to look at verse seven. It says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. This was not Isaiah speaking. This was the Lord speaking. Do you see it? This was the Lord speaking. He says, I formed the light and I create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. So when we begin to look at it, you know, a lot of people will say, wow, God created evil. How can God create evil? Why would God want to create evil? <laughs> Isn't that the question that we most of most we, we ask ourselves a number of times? Why would God create evil? Why is evil happening in all of this world? Why is God, if God says, if God is who God truly is, why is all this evil happening? You know, and they begin to what? They begin to blame God. But the truth of it is, the Bible says that what? <laughs> like I've always said, the message of the cross is to those who are perishing. But then to us who believe, it is what? The power of God. So it is a place where you begin to understand the purpose of why the evil was created. Now, let's look at verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2. It says here, the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So we, we you know, let's stop at verse 17. <laughs> so it says here, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So the father planted two trees in the garden. There were oh, so many trees, but there were two particular trees. Hence why it says you're free to eat from any tree. So then it says, you, you know, you must not eat. So the one tree they must not eat from is the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. Do you see it? So the tree of life was there for him to be able to eat from. <laughs> Do you see? He could have eaten from the tree of life if he wanted to, as much as he wanted to eat. But he chose because Eve offered that fruit to him. Eve offered the fruit of that tree to him. The knowledge of what? Good and evil. So now you can begin to see that eventually when that tree, when the food was, when the fruit was eaten, what happened? The Lord had to come down and he chased them out of the garden. Why? Because he didn't want them to touch the tree of life so that the state of Adam or the state of people through Adam will not permanently be of good and evil. Because why? You see, when the second Adam came, Jesus Christ, he came at the ministry of the spirit. Now we have become that spirit. So that's why we focus on the things above and not things that are here because we're seated in him. So if Adam had probably eaten of the tree of the tree of life, our state would have been what? Good and evil. So all we know about God is good and evil. All we know about everything around us is good and evil. So every time you see people, ah, this one is good. That one is bad. This one is good. That one is bad. This one is good. That one is bad. So, but the Lord came to reconcile that back to say that what? No, no man by the flesh. So he pointed it out because he doesn't want you to know people by good and evil. And that is why a lot of people go around calling people enemies. Don't do that. Because you know why? People are not enemies. The Bible says that what? No, no man according to the flesh. So the moment you begin to say people are enemies, then, you know, you've put yourself in a place that God has not ordained. People are not your enemy. Yes, the Bible declares that what? He uses people. He uses people. Just as God has angels, demons have uh, Satan has demons. <laughs> Do you see it? Because he goes about as what? Pretending to be the angel of light. So this is where we begin to understand the glorious dimension of what the Lord is speaking. So as we've reconciled that in itself, so what is the reason? Why did, so why did God, why would God basically, you know, why would the Bible tell us this, that, you know, God created, God created evil and, and why would God create evil for what reason and for what purpose? Let's go to Isaiah and chapter 54. I want us to go to, like I said, so we've seen in various dimensions. Let me just explain that quickly. Verse seven, the Bible says, I formed light. So the light that God formed is true. 
Genesis 1 and 3, let there be light and there was light and create darkness. So the Bible declares, it says the earth was void. Do you see it? In Genesis chapter 2, it was void. It was completely void. But the spirit of the Lord was hovering upon the face of what? The waters. So you see it. Let's read it together. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of the Lord was hovering over the waters. So in the midst of darkness, the spirit was what? Already hovering over the waters. But God said, let there be light. And this is where I've been helping us to understand the different degrees of light. So the light that manifested here was the light of what? Creation. So the light here was to establish creation. So that's why I said to each and every one of us, when the father wants to create with you, when you begin to hear this scripture a lot, Genesis 1-3, Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light and there was light. That means he wants to create with you. Do you see it? There is so much degree, but that's, that's not what I'm here to speak about today. So you can understand it in this dimension that what? He created light. Do you see it? He formed, he created darkness. He formed light, created darkness. He makes peace and creates evil. Now, we understand that the, the, the Bible tells us that Jesus, he says, in this world, you have trouble. But, you know, I've already overcome the world. My peace, I live with you, not as the world gives. Do you see it? So our peace in Christ Jesus helps us to understand that when we focus on him, he's able to make us to be at peace beyond all understanding. Now, let's see why God created evil. Isaiah and chapter 54. Let's go to Isaiah and 54. To to better understand why the father, because a lot of times we've quoted this scripture, we've quoted this scripture, we've quoted this scripture, but we miss the very important part of it to understand why God created evil in the first place. Now, I'm going to start from verse 11 and end at verse 17 where it all ends. Afflicted city, last by storms and not comforted. I will rebuild you with stones of turquoise, your foundations with lapis lazuli. I will make your battlements of rubies, your gates of sparkling jewels, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children will be taught by the Lord, and great will be their peace. In righteousness you will be established. Tyranny will be far from you. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will, not be, will be far removed. It will not come near you. If anyone does attack you, it will not be my own doing. Whoever attacks you will surrender to you. Do you see it? Now he says, see, it is I who created the blacksmith. Who finds the coals in the flame and forges a weapon fit for work? And it is I who created the destroyer to wreak havoc. No weapon formed against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. Do you see? We thank God. The Bible says, The accuser of the brethren who accuses them day and night. He has been hurled down <laughs> and overcame him by the what? By the blood. So that has been satisfied. But the father says he's the one who created the blacksmith, who finds the coals in the flame and forges a weapon fit for work. And it is I who created the destroyer to wreak havoc. <laughs> but no weapon formed against you will prevail. So why was that scripture given in the first place? Because for us to be able to understand it, we have to understand the mystery of the father. Do you see it? We have to understand the mystery of the Father. So what the Father was helping us to understand in this word is that the reason why he brought evil was to bring what? Destruction to the wicked because they've continued in their wickedness. But then for the righteous, he uses it sometimes to what? To bring us into alignment, to bring correction when we are moving away from the path of the Lord. This is the love of the Father. So when you begin to disobey God, <laughs> he raises a blacksmith. <laughs> he begins to fan the coal into flame. Do you see it? So for example, if the Lord has been telling you to do things and you don't do it, what happens? He raises a blacksmith. He, he basically raises one and begins to fan the coals in the flame. So whatever you're going through at that moment in time is because, so I'm speaking of for the righteous, you know, on, based on the righteous. So he's basically helping you to understand because we're in Isaiah 54. So the reason why he created the blacksmith and who finds the cold coals into flame is because one, you're out of alignment with the father. You're not doing what he instructed you to do. So then it begins to wreak havoc. 
And when he begins to wreak havoc, what happens? He says, not to worry. Whatever is coming against you will not prevail. But I'm using this to teach you something. I'm using this to bring you into alignment with me. Not every time may be the case that is because you've done something wrong. So the first is because you've either done something wrong, walking in rebellion, walking in disobedience, walking in what? In the very sin that the Father has been calling you away from. So you can begin to see it, that the reason why the Father allows this is because rebellion, sin, and disobedience. So when you rebel, <laughs> he raises. Let me show you a dimension of that in itself. Let's look at the dimension of Jeremiah. When God sent to Jeremiah, he sent Jeremiah to Israel. Hey, rest you know, you're basically, you're walking in wickedness. Return from your evil ways. Don't do this again. Don't do that again. You know, turn away from this. Turn away from that. Jeremiah continued to speak to them, to repent of their ways. But they all continued to blame Jeremiah. No, it is Jeremiah's fault. No, it is not us that you meant that for. It is you, <laughs> Jeremiah. It is you, Jeremiah. So they continue to, isn't that what they did to Jesus too? No, it is you, Jesus. It is not us. How can the Lord do that to us? It is you. So everybody continued to blame Jeremiah. They continue to put it on Jesus. It is him. Now you can begin to understand that eventually, what happened? The Bible declares that Jeremiah went and said to them, he said, God has raised someone against you. And what did he raise? Nebuchadnezzar. He said, this is what God has said. Remember, in the book of Jeremiah, where he put a yoke on his neck. So you can begin to see. Let's read that scripture so we can understand that dimension and understand the will of God. Because the mystery of God <laughs> is so beautiful. You know, that's why I love, I love the Father, you know, because when we understand the Lord, we begin to understand his ways. That's why I said to know the ways of God is way better. Because if you know the ways, when things are coming against you, the Father, everybody can say, that is not me, that is not God. But you will understand that eventually, it is God. The Bible says in Jeremiah 27, early in the region reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah. This word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord said to me. Make a yoke out of, out of straps and crossbars. Put it on your neck. Then send word to the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon. Through the envoys who came to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Give them a message for, the ma for their masters and say, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Tell this to your masters. With my great power and outstretched my arms, I made the earth and its people and the animals on it. I give it to anyone I please. Do you remember what he said about Nebuchadnezzar too when he was walking in pride? Nebuchadnezzar testified. He said, you do whatever you please. He says, now I will give all your countries into the hands of my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I will even make the wild animals subject to him. Do you see? It was not just people who are going to be subject to Nebuchadnezzar. It was the animals too. He says, all nations will serve him and his son and his grandson until the time for his land comes. Then many nations and great kings will subjugate him. Do you see it? And he says, if however, any nation or kingdom will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, or bow its neck under his yoke, I will punish that nation with the sword, famine, plague, declares the Lord, until I destroy it by its hand. So do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, or interpreters of dreams, your mediums or sorcerers who tell you you will not serve king of Babylon. They prophesy lies to you and will not serve and will only serve to remove you from your hands. I will banish you and you will perish. But if any nation will bow its neck under the yoke of king Babylon and serve it, I will let the nation remain in its own land to till it and to live there, declares the Lord. So you can begin to see. I gave the same message to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Now, he gave the same message <laughs> to what? Zedekiah, king of Judah, because he was not walking in the will of the Father. And then some, all of a sudden, he says that what? One of, the, one of the prophets rose up against him. And he said, ah, oh, what, is, what, is, what is Zedekiah? What is Jeremiah saying? What is he saying? You know, that, that cannot be the Lord. That's definitely not the Lord who is speaking. That's definitely not the Lord. And then eventually, what happened? Jeremiah went and told that prophet. He said, because of what you said, Hananiah, the false prophet, he said, no. He took the yoke of Jeremiah. He broke it. And upon breaking it, what happened? He said, the Lord said, you will not have to surrender to what? To Nebuchadnezzar. For the Lord will give victory. And because of that prophecy, Hananiah died. 
Do you see? So sometimes when God is speaking to us and we refuse to listen, that is when he puts us into the place where we don't want to be until we humble ourselves. So now you begin to understand in this dimension that what Jeremiah went and began to speak that I have raised Nebuchadnezzar against you because you refused to walk in my will. So now you will have to surrender to him. So if you don't surrender to him, then unfortunately you have to go into captivity. So now you can begin to see that sometimes the Lord always gives us an easy way out. But we are the ones who continue to refuse the easy way out. And then we go into what? The way that the Father has not ordained. This goes on and causes a whole lot of delays. So you can begin to see it. God raised. <laughs> so you can see, he says, I'm the one who forges, who created the blacksmith, and I forged the fans into flame. He forged. He created Nebuchadnezzar. He called Nebuchadnezzar. He brought Nebuchadnezzar forward. He, he created the, the very reason that Nebuchadnezzar was coming because in the Old Testament, they were created. In the New Testament, we're born. So now you can begin to understand it, that he found the things of Nebuchadnezzar. He found it into flame. So this is why I've always been encouraging people <laughs> do you see him? To what? To turn to the Lord. That whatever he's telling you to do, that you do it. So that you don't go, because that is the reason. When they began to ask for a king, and this God was like, I didn't want a king for you. But because of that desire, God left them into the hands of what? Of Saul. So we can see consistently in the Bible that those who continue to walk in sin, rebellion, and disobedience, God always what? He brings, yes, he brings a weapon. He brings what? He fans into flame. He creates a blacksmith to fan into flame. So why would we say, continue to say, with all of these things happening upon creation, why would we continue to say, why did God allow this to happen? Why did God allow this to happen? It was not the will of the Father. For that to happen in itself, but he was using it to bring correction to the people so that they can return back to the father. Remember, I've been sharing, there is a dimension in Isaiah 22 and 22 all the way down where people have always prayed that prayer. Hey, you know, if this president is not doing whatever it is that they're doing, may God remove them there from their position. And I've always shared with us that that prayer is absolutely wrong because the Bible tells us in itself, I am the one who put Pharaoh in authority. So the reason why God puts people in authority is because he can, he's using that authority to to call the people into order. Do you see him? He's calling them into order. So rather than submit, they are praying the person away. <laughs> Do you see? Rather than submit, no, we want them to go. We want them to go. We want them to go. But God will continue to basically bring the people they don't want until they surrender. So you can begin to see God was the one who raised Pharaoh so that he can, because he said, I raised them so that I can show my power through Pharaoh. So there's always a reason why that person is there not to pray them away. So you can begin to understand the first dimension of that. When I say when people are walking in what? In sin, rebellion, and disobedience. Secondly, it's always not because you've sinned and it's not because you've been disobedient and not because you've been rebellious. No, but most of the time, you know, when God leads us into the wilderness to be tried and to be tested, the truth of it is, we do not choose the training ground that God takes us through. God himself, is the one who orchestrates the training ground. So you can begin to understand it. Let's look at the realm of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Do you see him? And when he passed the test, he came out full of what? Full of power. So every dimension of Jesus was tested. His motives. What was the motive? Hey, if you bow down, you, if you worship me, I will give you all of this. But Jesus was like, hey. I can't do that, you know, because he says, worship the Lord your God. And then he said, you know, turn this stone into bread. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. So Jesus was tested in every dimension, but yet he passed the test. So you can begin to see it. Look at the dimension of Job at the same time. What did Job do? Job was only sacrificing. So that, you know, I don't, want my, I don't want my son to be, you know, in case they have sinned, you know, let me offer a gift to the Lord, you know, just to come, you know, Father, forgive them for their sins and things like that. And eventually, Satan went and God was the one who put Job on trial. Have you considered my servant Job? So sometimes God puts his people up <laughs> to be tried of the devil. So you can see it. He puts his people up because Job did not do anything wrong. 
But while Job was there, going through all of this that he was going through, do you know what happened? They came at Job from every dimension. Job, it is your fault. Job, you are the one who caused it. Job, yeah, that, that thing you said was, it was for you. Job, you are the one who did this. Job, you are the one that, did, you know, they basically continue to accuse Job. They were not looking at, you know, they were accusing him here. They were accusing him there. But Job, in all of its own, he just remained. He answered when he ought to answer. He kept quiet when he ought to keep kept quiet. But then, look at how God vindicated Job. God had to call the three people that basically went and accused him. He said, go to Job. From this moment, I have stopped answering your prayers. When Job prays for you, I will answer Job's prayers. This is why I told each and every one of us to be careful. Because you know why? You might, that, you might need the prayer of that person to eventually move forward. Because sometimes the Lord can shut things down. Because why? You're not, you know, because of the way you treated that person. So now you can begin to understand it, that the Lord had to tell the three boys to go to Job in order for them to be reconciled so that God will answer their prayer. But Job didn't do anything wrong. Job was innocent. Isn't that what happened with Jesus? When, when Herod was basically questioning him, Herod was saying all manner of things. But do you know what happened? The Bible declares and said that what? And he said, Job, and he said, Jesus, what? He remained silent. He didn't say anything. So most of the time when people are accusing, you remain silent. So you can begin to understand it. As long as you've obeyed God, let him continue. So Jesus kept quiet. He said nothing right after that. But then eventually, he said that once, he was crucified. But on the third day, he resurrected. And the people needed him. So you can begin to understand the dimension. So sometimes, when all these things are happening, it's not because you've done anything wrong. When the weapons are being forged, it's not because you've done anything wrong. It's actually because you are light. That's what happened with Jesus. When the three uh, wise men, well, sorry, when the wise men, not the three wise men, there is no three wise men in the Bible. So when the wise men, when they came to Jesus, I mean, when they came to Herod, he said, hey, tell me where he is so that I too may go and worship him. So you can see the motive of Herod unleashed when they what? When they basically went and spoke when they when they came to inquire of jesus tell me where he is come back and tell me where he is so that i too may go and worship him and when they didn't come back what happened he decided to kill all the two-year-olds in town so you can begin to understand it that for some of you it's not because you've done anything wrong but god the lord actually allows it so that he can bring what so that you can be so for it's either for your training it's either for you know to help you to persevere it's either for you to endure so that's how you endure suffering that's how you endure what is coming against you because he says he that endure it to the end shall be saved so the father can actually use that situation to teach you how to endure so he basically created the blacksmith fanning all of these things to flame that was what happened with the three hebrew boys did they do anything wrong they didn't do anything wrong but they were thrown in the fire and they endured in that moment in time and what happened they were brought out and not a single hair on their body was burnt so you can begin to see it. So the first dimension is because they're walking in rebellion, disobedience, and in sin. The second dimension is because they have not done anything wrong. So if people continue to say, why does God allow all of these things? It is sometimes because God is using, he's allowed, he can stop it if he wants to. He's God. But most of the time, he allows it. So that what? He can bring the people to repentance. So that he can bring the people to repentance. So most of the evil that you see is to bring judgment, correction, for what? Realignment. Back to God. And sometimes, like I said, you might not have done anything wrong, but allows that to happen so that you can bring, so that he can bring you back to himself or to get you to endure. This is why you see the scripture in 1 Peter 1. It says that what? A gold tested through fire. <laughs> what was the blacksmith doing? He was fanning things into flame. He was fanning things to flame so that when you come out on the other side, you may come out as what? As pure gold. This is the genuineness of what? Of faith that is what? Being manifested. So now let's look at the dimension of what? Of Noah and the ark. Look at it. The Bible says hey, the earth was wicked. There was just so much wickedness upon the earth. And God had to what? Allow rain for 40 days. Ah, that is evil. Why would God do something so evil to basically kill everybody? The Bible says they were walking in wickedness. So you can begin to see 
The Bible says the wicked, they will, they will continue to be wicked, but then he brings the wickedness to the end. He brings them to their end. It is not God who basically kills the wicked people. They kill themselves by the acts in which they are doing because God has been speaking to them concerning their wickedness, but they refuse. So when God withdraws his mercy, they are no longer under the protection of the Father anymore. Then in that way, given over to their wickedness, they get destroyed. Do you see? So that is the reason why a lot of people, God always sends his prophets ahead to basically correct, to rebuke. But most of the time, because they've refused, then God leaves them over to themselves. And sometimes they will think, yeah, God is with me because I'm speaking the word of God. But the Bible declares, God left Saul and went on to David. So David was still in the office, but David, I'm sorry, Saul was still in the office, but he was no longer functioning. <laughs> Do you see it? He was still in the office of the king, but the spirit had left. So most people are in the office because of disobedience and rebellion, but yet the spirit of the Lord is gone. Do you see that dimension? So it's a place where I'm always encouraging each and every one of us. So in the place of Noah, can you see it? The Bible declares because of their wickedness, God had to bring destruction upon what? Upon the earth. Hence the reason he flooded the earth with water, destroying mankind. Why? Because of wickedness. That is why there is a reward for wickedness, Psalm 91. He tells us at the same time, he says, let the wheat and the chaff to go together. And at the, what? At the appointed time, he will what? He will separate. So it is the Lord who does the separating. So you can begin to understand. So when people are leaving you and they say, hey, don't worry about me anymore. You go your own way. Go. That is the Lord separating. So most of the time, it is because you are about to enter into harvest. And the reason why they cannot go with you is because the Father does not want them inheriting from the promise that he has ordained for you. So don't fight people to stay. Let them go if they have to. Because you know why? You have a greater dimension. You have a purpose to fulfill. You have the word of the Lord to continue. And they themselves, like I said, because of what it is that they're doing, the father will have to bring justice to it. So he had to bring justice to what? To Noah and, and his fam and, and you know what was happening in creation at that particular time. So we can continue to understand Isaiah 55 and 11. He says, the word of the Lord, when spoken, will not return to him void. Now you see, when God speaks, it will not return to him void. The Lord said he did not allow the words of Samuel to fall to the ground. So you can understand the dimension of the word that you are. Christ is the word. You are Christ. And hence the reason why he tells you, don't be afraid. Speak the word. Because you know why? Your word will eventually come to pass. So most of the time, like I said, he raised up Nebuchadnezzar. And in the dimension of the children of Israel. So you can see that when the children of Israel, I believe, you know, they were under the, the Roman Empire. When they thought, yeah, <laughs> you know, Jesus will come. You know, Jesus has come to bring them out from under the Roman, Roman establishment. Jesus said, that's not what I came to do. <laughs> not at all. I'm not here to bring you out of that. I'm here to reconcile you back to God because that is the most important thing. When I reconcile you back to God, then you will come out of your captivity. Do you see it? So this is the first dimension Look at Daniel at the same time. Daniel was speaking the things of God. And when he knew it was time for them to leave captivity, he began to pray. But it was all for what? Reconciliation. So the father is intention. Yeah, before you leave that captivity, he basically reconciles you first. Do you see it? That is what he did. They were all in captivity. But then when Jesus went on the cross and resurrected, we all came out of every captivity. That is why the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 3, uh, chapter 4, it says, uh, chapter 4, chapter 5, it says, do not be yoked. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Do not be yoked again into slavery. He brought us into a realm to understand that we are seated with him. Nothing can hold you captive anymore because you're one with him. But when you walk in disobedience rebellion and all of that you go back into it not because god ordained it you took yourself there because you know why you refuse to listen so it is a place where we continue to understand that god is just do you see him so is god evil is god just is god good god is good god is not evil no not at all but he created evil so he created evil to unleash evil upon wickedness he created evil so that he can bring these people back into alignment with him. He created evil so that what? 
to test for what? Endurance. Do you see it? <laughs> so yes, God created evil. He did. And he did it. That's why he says all things. So if you're in Christ, all things are working together for your good. Now, I want us to list, I want us to read this dimension. First Timothy chapter one, uh, uh, to understand this in context. Because you understand, you know, hey, you know, what, what is happening here? What, why, why would Apostle, Apostle uh, you know, Paul basically speak to Timothy concerning, you know, uh, concerning this? Let's go to verse 19 and 20. And this is what he says. He says, Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by calling them, you may fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them, I am Aeneas and Alexander, whom I have handed over Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Do you see him? It says, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck. Do you see? You can see Apostle Paul, when he was speaking in the book of Acts, don't do what you're doing. Don't go on that journey. But they decided to, they refused to listen to Apostle Paul. Eventually what happened? They suffered shipwreck. He said, not to worry. <laughs> the Lord has told me, none of you will die, but the ship will be lost. So some people, he has said to them, none of you will die, but you know what? Your ministry will be lost. The business will be lost. All of that will be lost. Why? Because they rejected <laughs> the word. And there they suffered shipwreck with regard to what? Faith. So therefore, he says, among them are Hermeneus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. So you can understand, even Satan does not blaspheme against God, but you are blaspheming. <laughs> you see it? You are blaspheming. They blaspheme against God. No, God cannot do that. No, God will never do that. No, God can't do that. No, God. So the very thing that you're saying God cannot is what God is actually doing. So we have to be careful with that word. God cannot, God cannot, God cannot, God cannot. And some people they've taken, you know, that's why I said we play with the things of God so dangerously. We do. We play with the things of God very, very dangerously. That's why you can see when Jesus was talking about, when Jesus was talking about the parable of the vineyard, you know, there was the vineyard. God set up a vineyard. He sent his prophet. They killed the prophet. Some they stoned. And eventually he sent his son. They killed the son. And what did God do? God went and avenged. So he basically, you know, he took care of those who were there and gave the vineyard to someone else. So you can begin to understand that dimension that the Lord, so if people are coming against you again and again and again, you know, they're not going to get away with it. <laughs> do, you, do you understand that in itself? But it is not your place to be looking for revenge and vengeance. No, not at all. Because you see in this part here, it says they were handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. So when you begin to blaspheme against God, when you begin to read the scriptures in a manner that is not of the Lord, this is why I've been telling a lot of people that, you know, when God is saying, hey, I want to teach you the word, but you're doing it by yourself. You know, it's a place where the father is saying, hey, you know, if you continue in that manner, it's, a, it's just a matter of time when you're handed over to Satan. Because why? If you don't basically obey, this is eventually what will happen because he will have to teach you a thing or two. He will teach you a thing or two about humility. He will teach you a thing or two about what? About all of these dimensions. Not to blaspheme, not to speak against the things of God, not to say, hey, God is not in that. God is not. God can never do that. God can never do that. God can never do that. Can I share a testimony? I shared this to the glory of God. I remember there was a time you know, I was in a place and the father was helping me to share a word and he was saying, you know, uh, 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 he said, hey, you know, this is what's happening. Uh, I want you to speak this counsel to my people. And I spoke the counsel. And while I was speaking the counsel, you know, the person kept coming against me and he said, hey, that is not the Lord. That can never be the Lord. Maybe for you it is, but for everybody that cannot be the Lord. And the person went on and on concerning that. And the father said, just keep quiet. Do you see it? The father said, just keep quiet. Be silent over it all and watch what's going to happen. So I basically, but in that moment in time, it was not a place where I'm like, hey, father, this is what is going to happen. Yeah, father, I'm so excited. No, no, no. The father kept me in a posture of prayer. Continue to pray for them. Continue to pray for them. And I, in obedience to that, I continue to pray. Eventually, the Lord said, leave that place. And I left. And upon leaving, not less than a week, the council in which they rejected 
eventually came to pass. So when someone called me and said, hey, you know, and the father has been speaking to me, please show mercy. Please show mercy. He was saying to me, please show mercy. You know, I'm like, father, you know, and I began to speak to the Lord. I said, Lord, in this, I, don't, I don't have the strength at this point in time. You would have to help me. He said, please show mercy. Just show mercy. Just show mercy. At that particular moment, everything about that person, you know, I believe they felt ill and the person was, you know, they were, it, the health issue was not going, it was not going well at all. So when the news got to me, so I, we began to, I, you know, the Lord began to, I, I, you know, there was such a powerful move that morning because that morning the person called me and said, you know, let us pray. And the Lord had instructed, yeah, pray for that person. He said, your prayer, I will answer according to the book of what? Job chapter 42. So I pray and I began to call the person's health back that whatever death has been launched upon that person, it will not manifest. I began to speak light over that person, speak the essence, speak their spirit back to them and declare the quickening spirit over, over them. After that prayer, it began to what? The person began to get well. After they began to get well, began to get well. Eventually they were discharged. So sometimes you can see that your answer to your prayer can be in the very one that you rejected. So sometimes that's why I said the father can allow some things to happen to bring humility to the other person, to bring humility, to teach people not to blaspheme against God, that you say it is not God, it is not God, but it is God all the while. So you can begin to understand it. This is the reason why he creates evil, to bring us back into alignment. Those who are what? In the righteousness of God. So this is why God sends his prophet again and again. But when they refuse to listen, he allows evil in their presence until they learn and turn, then he relents from it. And if they don't relent from it, then he eventually hands them over completely to that wickedness. Now, let's see the dimension of what I'm speaking of from the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Because a lot of us, we've read this scripture, but we've not understood why, you know, this always happens. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. And I want us to look at, look at it in, in full context. The Bible says here in verse 4, In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have, con you ha and you have completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, if we all had, fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it how much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live they disciplined us for a while as they thought best but god disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness no discipline is seems pleasant at the time but painful later on it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it do you see it you can see the reason why the lord disciplines is because of his love and this is why I've been sharing with you. He does this to bring reconciliation. And it is because of what? Holiness. Because sometimes it's about the people. So when you speak the word, it's about the people. For whatever you do, it's about the people. And this is the question I've always asked people. You know, I've said, you know, a lot of people, they call themselves Christians. They call themselves believers. They call themselves children of God. They call themselves all of these terms of slavery that the Father has not ordained for us to walk in. How much more. Let me put this as a question to you. Ponder on it. Take it to the Father. And probably he will give you an insight. When you get to heaven and the Lord is asking you for the account of what you've done and he eventually tells you that you've put more people in slavery than you've actually set them free, what would be your reaction really? When I said I needed you to set them free, but you brought them into slavery so much more. I needed you to set them free from Christianity but you basically projected that so much more. You led them into slavery. You didn't set them free. They were much more in slavery than in what? Than in freedom. So it is a place where you begin to understand. That is why I believe the call that the father has placed for me to walk in 
is to bring people out of what? Out of that, those identities. That is why I've been emphasizing on the son to help us to understand that in itself, that the very identity that God has left with us is the identity of our sonship, nothing else. There is no other identity in the Bible, yes, other than our sonship under Christ Jesus. Like I said, under Christ Jesus. That is why it says that what? Anybody who is what? He says, for God so loved the word that he gave. And he says, what? If you're baptized, John 3, he says, you will see the kingdom of God. So for you to see God so much more, you have to turn to Christ. So through Christ, you see God so much more. So this is why he's calling you. So the discipline that you're going to go is for you to understand that what? Is bringing holiness, righteousness, is producing harvest in your life. So the reason for why Lord, the Lord created evil is not basically to bring destruction over you. It is to bring correction over you. It's not to bring destruction over you who is in Christ, but to bring you into a place of endurance and perseverance. That is what Apostle Paul walked in. Look at what Apostle Paul walked in. Evil every single time. Pharisees and Sadducees, the same people that Christ came to bring out of, but yet they continue to stone him. They continue to reject him. They put him out for him to die. People walked away from him, but yet he still had to continue. He endured for the sake of the gospel. But yet when he finished, he said what? He said, I have finished the good fight of faith. So you can see that all the evil that was orchestrated against him was pushing him even further into the gospel of Christ. So most of the time, we don't run away from it. We basically walk through it. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil. Do you see it? Fear no evil. For he has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. So when God said, I created the blacksmith and I fanned his works into flame, he's the one who created. He created the destroyer. Why? Because every single time you blaspheme, everything that you've done, it basically brings it under destruction if it's not under the will of God. So you might have done so many things and yet those things will not last because when it is tested through fire, it will not stand. It's eventually wiped out. Do you see it? So this is why we have to be careful. So understand, we don't call what God has called something and we don't say it, it cannot be God. Let's not do that. Let's honor the Father. So when somebody speaks something, you take it to the Father. Lord, is this you? Allow him. Don't let your opinions lead your judgment. Don't let your what? Projections lead your judgment. Don't let your insecurities lead your judgment. Don't let anything that has come against you lead your judgment. Don't let your past lead your judgment. But allow the Lord to minister to you. And say, Father, I might not be okay with this. But what is your will concerning it? So he, you might not know but he will tell you because he's faithful. He's always wanting to reveal it to you. So I leave you with this word today, just for us to understand that God is the one who created evil and he creates it, like I said, because of two reasons. One, to bring judgment for the wicked, correction to those who are in the body, and he brings what? So he brings judgment for the wicked. So it's for those who are walking in wickedness, he brings judgment over that. And then secondly, for those who are in Christ Jesus, he brings correction against your sin, rebellion, and all of those things. And for some of you, you have not done anything wrong, but it's just for you to endure the time and the process. Do you see it? To God be the glory. I bless you all with the blessings of the Father. And I thank you for just being here today. May the Lord continue to bless you and uphold you because he loves you so very much. Yes, he loves you. He loves you because everything that God does is intentional. And he's not doing anything to basically, you know, I, I want to finish you off. No, not at all. He says that what? In verse 10 of Hebrews chapter 12, they disciplined us for a while as thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness because no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, do you see it? Later on. So whatever you're speaking, later on. Whatever you're saying, later on. Whatever God has instructed you to say, later on. It produces a harvest of righteousness and of peace for those who have been trained by it. So if you're going through it now, it will produce righteousness. It will produce peace. It will produce what? Holiness. Do you see it? To God be the glory. I bless each and every one of you. 
and I honor the Father for you. You all are amazing. And I love you all in Christ Jesus. Stay blessed because you're the blessedness of the Father. To God be the glory. I love you all. Amen and amen.